special pops, like boom, we're done. Nice review. Okay, so uh, multi-system trauma. The thing with trauma is significant trauma, major trauma. It just doesn't affect one system. Like somebody's just not going to have fractures. If they have fractures, they'll have soft tissue injury. Uh, someone in a, a large, significant, high mechanism automobile accident will have could have chest injury. So multi-system means just like it says, multi-system. So organ systems different. Like you might have a heart involved, a lung involved, airway involved, fractures, musculoskeletal, right? So multiple body systems, okay, and there's different con considerations for the special populations, which are pediatrics, geriatrics, and OB, okay, and then they added this cog cognitively impaired patient, okay, uh, I, I tell you a, a funny story that was really pretty funny after we get to that, but Anyway, uh, multiple systems, so more than one uh, system involved, high mortality, uh, death rate, okay? So when, what happens with the typical trauma patient is they may survive the actual accident, but there's so many systems involved, just like medical, you know, it's like we're talking about, you have someone with renal failure, CHF, and uh, diabetes. Or whatever. So you start listing off the medical things that they have. They have multi-system medical problems, right? So they have different systems, multiple systems, and it complicates things the same way as this would complicate things. So, and they definitely are in a higher uh, category of shock because they have more systems involved, right? So, anyway, definitive care is surgery. The large majority of the time they need to go to level one and so they uh so they have the surgeon at hand handy these things here that we're going to flip through fairly quick it's the same process over and over it's just very repetitive in here that you go off the the skill sheet your trauma quote skills guide right uh trauma assessment sheet so they say what happens next what do you determine right so this is We've been through this enough where it's nauseating. You know, determine the scene is safe, determine original uh, additional resources. This is not on the skill sheet, but look for a mechanism. Well, it is really look for a mechanism of injury, right? Life threats, life bleeding, hold C spine, oxygenate them, treat them for shock, uh, use spinal mobilization, and always rapid transport. When you talk about trauma, rapid transport. So when you're doing your skills test, it will be rap I'm going to rapid, rapidly transport the patient. Uh, so you'll do your secondary exam, your head to toe, everything while you're en route. Okay. So as you're working through that skill sheet, uh, you get down to the point where you're going to put them on a backboard and rapid transport, and I'll do everything on the way to the hospital. And that is in class, classroom and real life. Uh, my, my MO that I sort of tried to do with, with trauma patients is once we got them on the stretcher and in the ambulance, they shut the doors and drive off. I can do everything in route. I can, everything I do is in route. So we, as soon as the Stretch was in there and locked in. Let's go. Remember, 10 minutes is the, the rule, right? We wouldn't want to waste any time. BLS wise, if it's, you know, you're on a BLS crew, you can definitely do everything around. You can splint around. Uh, and when we're talking about pregnant patients, see, patients in trauma, okay, it is ambulance that don't have the stethoscopes or the equipment to measure, but the on the cheaper line, you can't you can't hear that well with them. Okay, so you can't really tell what the babies. Do you remember that mom has a lot more blood volume uh, during the third during the tri third trimester, and the heart rate's going to be up a little bit. Anytime that uh, like mom's in a wreck or a fall or something, and they hit their stomach, they're they're going they're going to want to go to the hospital get their baby evaluated.
and that's okay. That's probably pretty good, right? Some of us care more about our children. Just saying, some people like that, right? Apparently not. The uterus is, has a lot of vessels attached to it. It's very vascular, so uh, uh, a uterine rupture would be significant. Feel pain at different, different, on a different spectrum. Okay, so that might be diminished somewhat uh, because of the everything is sort of pushed up. That they have a the third trimester. It's sitting on top of the bladder, so uh, you know rupture of the bladder. Uh, and always keep in mind you have two patients so the more that the, the it's, you can sort of translate that into the baby as well the baby can be just as, as critical okay so start contractions so if mom is close and all of a sudden she's in a car wreck in the middle of this trauma so they could go into labor if they're really high you know if it's you know they could sneeze and spit out the baby at that point. Then you could really, this is a little last year, abrupto placenta, so you can relate it to trauma. But abrupto uh, placenta, it's normally at the top of the uterus, and so it would detach abruptly. And uh, when you see this, it's, it's closely related to trauma, but there's some telltale signs of it, just like there's shortness of breath, nausea, vomiting, those are like classic signs. This classic sign here, an abrupto placenta, would be uh, painful, bright red, vaginal bleeding. So painful, bright red, vaginal bleeding. When, uh, when we do OB next week, we'll have abrupto previa. It just doesn't sound like I'm saying that right. Saying it right, you have abrupto placenta and then placenta previa. Okay, placenta previa is where the uh, placenta moves in front of the uh, birth center. Okay, uh, the difference in here is abrupto placenta is uh, painless, bright red, vaginal bleeding. Okay, so just the two remember the abrupt, abrupto. Pain when you can get that. They are sort of rare as well. And like talk about the, the, the uterus could, could rupture the baby. So always look for the signs of shock. All right? Remember that like every patient, treat for shock, right? You always treat for shock. So definitely be unaware that the with pregnant trauma patients that Shot can uh, be delayed, mask, so I would go ahead and, and, and treat for shock all the time. I do that with all the patients anyway. Always look for shock. Shock is the killer, is what's going to kill. It sort of sneaks up on you, and uh, if you're not watching for it, and then your patient dies. So always think about shock. Here's something that you hear in the movies and, and everything else pulseless pregnant trauma patient. And this is used according to your protocol. You will have typically a protocol. If you don't have a protocol, then you need to just, you would contact medical control, right? So you're at this motor vehicle wreck, and the, the mom is a fatality, okay? We don't know about the uh, baby. baby, right? So some protocols will say we'll try to resuscitate the mom, do CPR resuscitative efforts on the mom, bring them in. When we get in, they can do they they can do emergency C section, okay, and see if, if the baby survived, right? You hear all these crazy stories about, you know, EMS guys doing emergency C sections in the field. And uh, it it came from a reliable source, but I couldn't find it, so I'll give you the short version of it. I believe it was New York, two paramedics, same thing. Mom was decapitated. Oh, so obvious sign of death, right? Yeah. yeah. No head, no life, right? So mom was decapitated. 
they they had the ability to hear fetal heart tones and they heard fetal heart tones uh, from the story goes they called medical control medical control gave them permission to do an emergency c-section it's not really that hard if you think about the anatomy you cut at the diaphragm process to the belly button and keep cutting until you find what baby, baby. keep cutting you're not going to damage mom right Keep cutting until you find baby, pull baby out. Well, yeah. Okay, all's good, right? <laughs> From the story goes, maybe that was it. From the story goes, <laughs> Renata, now, I mean, that's, that's all for looks. That's just to make it pretty? Yeah. Yeah. When, you, uh, when you're in a hurry, I would use the exact right process though to the belly button. Wouldn't it be like the belly button down? You know. Yeah, cut from here. It's hard. I know, but that's yeah. well, third trimester, the fundus is way up there, so um, you know, so you would cut, and so you just keep cutting till you find baby, okay? And uh, anyway, the story goes is they saved this the lot. They saved this baby's lot. They were in the paper, okay? Any guesses where they're at now? Yeah. Prison, yeah. if they're still there. They practice medicine without a license. Even though their medical director had some involvement, it was way outside their scope of practice. Wow. Way outside their scope of practice. So they convicted them of this, even though. So what if the dad doesn't want to convict them? Like, it doesn't matter. The state will. They, they practice outside their scope of practice. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so you get all those crazy things, right? That you get that uh, doesn't really happen. So, uh, and there's more. There's there's like a list of of, of different things that the state has, uh, different states have done when the provider has saved people's lives, but they just went outside their scope of practice to do it. Yeah, and they hammer them for it. They know better. They should know better, right? So. Do that more than likely they're gonna say yeah do CPR on the mom bring them in and we're gonna get the patient well that that case there they could just bring the baby in and, and get the head you know just like that's cute because like I mean like so like they have no head they're not even close to waiting it's not that's not even gonna happen and they saved their life. Your emotions, listen, 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 when it, comes, when it comes to government and the state, it does not matter about your emotions. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's true. When, when the law, then you, you have to discern between the differences. Is, is this worth me losing my livelihood over? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Could be, but you just you, you have to think it's 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 a harder decision than than, than what you think. How much prison time? I don't I don't know. I sort of lost it when, when they said that. Five years and under, Jack will do it. No, I'm you, it's when you get into those sort of ethical, legal, really really gray areas. You you do have to. You do have to think about it. Oh, if you, you know. said yes to medical control, that's like, okay, I'm a period. So like medical yeah. control is way further than Exactly. Yeah. That, and that's a good question because what should have the provider told the doctor? It's out of your scope of practice. Right. It's outside of my scope of practice, doc. I can't do that. Mm -hmm. The same thing I've told doctors before. I can't do that. It's outside my scope of practice. It's Thank way you. outside my protocol. I'm not going to do that. So, Ethical, legal, you, you, you have to think about it. It's your, your livelihood. You need to go be a Walmart greeter all right, afterwards. But anyhow, so do, do give that some thought, okay? When you, when you have a patient, pregnant patient, especially in the second, third trimester, uh, and you have to immobilize them on a spinal board, you would tilt the board up to the side uh, to prevent this syndrome here which is this supine hypotensive syndrome what this occurs is when the baby when the mom's laying supine and the baby is on the vena cava it causes the patient to go hypotensive if the patient goes hypotensive 
So it follows the bank drive. Okay, so uh, if you do have to uh, mobilize a second, third trimester patient, tilt, uh, tilt that board up, branch the board up on, on the side, okay, with some blankets or something, keep the baby off the vena cava so uh, they don't get the, the supine hypotensive syndrome. And that's what you're going to see, like in a test question, it'll be a scenario. Mom slings the pine on the backboard, all of a sudden her pressure drops. What do you do? Tilt, tilt the board. Okay, get the baby off of the, off there. And they can, uh, infants and children respond very well to oxygen and they respond very poorly to the lack of oxygen, even inside babies, okay? So we wanna make sure that uh, we don't let mom get hypoxic. We go ahead and give them give them some oxygen as well. In in the ear canal, just like we were talking about, okay, you wouldn't pack anything, okay? So if you do have some this way too, what will happen is that they can they can sort of determine or approximate the blood loss that way as well. Okay? So if you have if you've soaked six five by nine pads, that's quite a bit of blood. And I can't remember the number, but each five, five by nine pad equates to so much blood loss yeah. on an estimate. So this is the way that they would estimate blood loss. And again, anticipate shock, treat for shock, okay? And it's good to consider air medical. It's also uh, good to consider shock-wise, they can start out depending on where you're at, okay? And have a multi, this is multi, talk about multi-system. So you have a multi-system trauma patient, which is going to, like baby, you need to consider. Ambulances today can hold two patients, uh, but we only transport one. We don't. We transport one critical patient at a time, unless it's a mass casualty incident. And we'll get into that later. Four, five. We put one on the bench, one on the cot. We had a way, we call it hanging them, but we, you suspended two from the roof and you could actually fit one in the floor in between the bench. You got the bench, the floor, and then the EMS stretcher. And I've done it. I've transported five patients before like that. And, uh, so, like, if the mom's like studying C sections, but. Oh, well, you can. Uh, and you would if they're crowning it. But consider two ambulances. If, if the. Well, talk about. What about the little kids? Trauma is like one of the leading causes of death in, in children, young children, okay? So they're, they're, they're at risk for abuse as well, okay? Multi-system trauma abuse, where there's, you have child abuse and it affects the uh, different systems. But there's a, you, you look at all the mechanism of injuries, when the summer comes up, you always hear about drownings, right? I mean, they start to fall up, burns, falls, uh, motor vehicle collisions, especially uh, with unrestrained uh, children in the car. Uh, if, it was, if it was up to me, the, the parents would be prosecuted over that by not restraining their children properly in a car. But I'm not the DA, so it's not my, not my opinion, but I would prosecute them. I'd send them to prison if I was a judge. Anyway, uh, kids, they do have heavy heads. They're big old head, little body, right? <laughs> we grow into our head. Thank goodness, can you imagine being an adult, being that big head, you know? But you, you have that huge head, and the neck muscles are relatively weak compared to the, the head, so they, they have neck injuries, C-spine injuries, okay? But they're still really pliable in the chest. There's, there's still a lot of cartilage in the chest, okay? So... They don't break like an adult would, because we're all nice and cartilage. I've seen a, a little kid, I, I think he was two or three maybe, he was a little booger eater, like this tall, <laughs> but he walked off the balcony, and he fell from the second floor balcony. And we got there, and we, I mean, we're like, okay, we heard the kid fell, you know, 20, 30 feet, and they got, yeah, that's him over there. He's just like running around, playing. 
I can go to the theater and go, oh, okay. And I go, no, he, he fell. He just sort of bounced. And, <laughs> I'm like, okay. What did he land on? So the dirt. So I went out to the balcony. I looked oh. over the balcony. And that's when laughing inside really pays off. Because I've been here and I'm just busting out laughing inside. I looked over there. And you know the uh, road runner and the oh. coyote? Where he always fell off the little mountain or whatever. And he went splat. And you could see the outline of the coyote. Yeah. I looked over the balcony and I could see the little outline of the kid. Oh, my God. <laughs> I'm like, wow. But uninjured. We, I mean, we took him to the hospital because he fell 20 feet, but he was completely uninjured. He was playing like a kid. There's nothing really wrong with him. Okay? So uh, they're really flexible. But when we got into the hospital, when we got to the ambulance, I'm just like, you're, you're not going to believe this. And uh, I, I think. My partner actually walked over there before we, we drove off and looked at the little dirt mark on the ground. Because we laughed about it all day. It had been bad if the baby was hurt. Anyway, uh, next week you'll learn about this pediatric assessment triangle. And this just gives you a guidance to go by on how to assess a pediatric. Okay? Well, this is just a trailer. I don't want to spoil it for you for next week. But we'll learn about the pediatric assessment triangle. It's a very good tool to use. Okay. Most of the time, if you do work in medicine, uh, there's this is an abbreviation for something else. But the uh, PALS is pediatric advanced life support. More like if you go to work at Children's or somewhere like that, you would take PALS. You would take pediatric advanced life support, just the way you would take. Uh, Cardiac ACLS, Advanced Cardiac Life Support, if you work at a hospital. You're going to take those two. They're like little weekend classes. You'll take those two. Sort of additional learning on uh, children. If you work in a NICU, then you'll take other courses as well to, to learn how to do resuscitation. But we'll pick that up next week, okay? So these little kids. What's their heart rate? Heart rate is very important. So you start having changes in heart rate, you have to be aware of that. Rate, I know we don't look at rhythms, cardiac rhythms as EMTs, but rate, rhythm, and pressure. Uh, you, can, you can assess the rhythm, can't you? Yeah. You can assess the rate. How would you assess the rhythm? We don't have heart monitors in the ambulance at BLS. Hmm. But how would you assess the rhythm? I you if they're conscious, you would palpate their radial pulse and you would sit there for a moment and try to see if this is a rhythmic pulse or not. Exactly. You just feel for the bump and check to see if it's a regular rhythm. Okay? Or is it irregular? Okay. Now remember, children have sinus dysrhythmias where they uh when they inhale their, I think it's the inhalation, their heart rate goes up, exhalation it slows down. So a lot of children have irregular rhythms, but you know that, you know the child breathing and the heart rate going up, okay? But you can assess rhythm if you want to, but and then pressure. Right? We don't want the kiddo to get hypoxic, all right? They get bradycardic really quick when they get hypoxic, but guess what? What fixes that? Oxygen. Yeah, give them some oxygen. It fixes it really quick. Okay? Uh, little kids, three years or younger, you won't be able to really obtain a blood pressure. You would just do pulse and respiratory rates when it comes to those vital signs. Don't worry about a blood pressure. And those, you just put, they would know, like on your chart, they figure it out. They look, oh, two year old. Yeah, you won't have a blood pressure. Right? You won't need it. This is what we've been talking about when uh, on the skill sheets, okay? I was, like if you had a kid here with, like with Fred, you don't want his head flexed, you want it neutral, right? Mm -hmm. So you have the headband here, but remember those kids have these big old heads, right? So it's going to create a void 
by the shoulders. This will be, create a space there so you can take some abdominal dressings or sheets or whatever and pad those voids to make sure that you keep the head in a neutral position. Because if you don't, their big heads are going to flex, flex their head up like that because of that void. Heads are going to drop back and they're going to, their heads are going to flex. And obviously if they're gurgling or <clears throat> strider, that upper respiratory thing, we don't want to look at suctioning, correct? And we'll go through this again in pediatric emergencies. With geriatrics here in just a second, you would pad the voids the same way. You're going to have patients who have like osteoporosis. They're, they're, they're all twisted, right? And, and they may not be able to lay exactly flat. And so you would have to pad those voids around there to keep, keep their uh, head, their, their neck from flexing. Anyway, just like every patient, keep them warm, treat for shock, keep them warm, warming measures, okay, and then transport rapid, rapid transport. Always look for shock. So let's talk about old people. Geriatric patients, we have a whole chapter on this. By the way, I'm not a geriatric. Geriatric is like 65 and older. Get that out of your head. I'm still a young person. Okay. It is significant. Uh, death and significant injury is greater, okay, in the young and the elderly. The, the elderly patient, and I don't want to steal away the, the whole chapter on this, but their, their muscles get smaller. I mean, their, their skin is thinner. Uh, historically, uh, the, the muscles are, are weaker, right? Their bones become more fragile. They have more past medical history. So not only can they be involved in a trauma, but all of a sudden now you're, you have chest trauma, but you have problems with your heart, right? So if I'm, you have cardiac history, now you've been smacked in the chest. So you, a uh, fractured hip is the most common injury, more than likely, in a, they, they get on walkers or crutches or, or the canes and everything, and they're, they trip, they usually go to the side, they land right there on that, on that joint, okay, between the, the pelvis and the femur, and fracture their hip, okay. It's devastating to a geriatric patient or anybody really to fracture their hip because they lose mobility. But anyway, falls are common. They don't catch themselves as well as younger people do because their reflexes are slower. So they fall and they strike their head, right? Instead of stick, we would stick, me included, <laughs> stick our arms out to catch ourselves, right? A geriatric, their, their reflexes are slower. So they would, just, they would just fall and not be able to catch themselves. Major head trauma, by the way, a bunch of times you go there and Pops has fallen and uh, especially in the bathroom, it's small, there's a lot of things there, they get tripped up, they hit their heads on the sink, to the bathtub, uh, it, it, it kill them very easily, okay? Change like we just talked about, lungs, cardiovascular system, musculoskeletal system, they're not as coordinated as, as usual as when they were younger. By the way, you guys will be there, right? Every time, I, mean, I think 40 is a big stretch for you to look at 40. Do y'all still think 40 is old? Mm -hmm. The elementary school kids think you're old, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow, you're so old. Yeah. But, uh, Everything after 40 changes. Your body starts changing after 40, okay? You, you feel the weather. There's a cold front moving in this weekend, right? I felt it yesterday. My, in my wrist. That's so why I'm wearing this, by the way. I feel the cold front. Because... Huh? Golf injury. 
yeah. That's all right. My friends, I be proven, you know, and all, and all these things from flipping upside down. <laughs> just, just, just wait till you turn 40. You would feel that. You know that it's going to be cold. My knee hurts. That's how I think I yeah, in, in your what? 17? Yeah. Yeah. So the uh, last night? Well, okay, and they don't compensate to change very well or injury, okay? Pre existing conditions. When when you see alter mental status and a normal responsive A and O times four uh, geriatric patient, that's significant. Okay? So we want to look at these things. Not that you can necessarily change change it, but you definitely want to realize that's a significant outcome, a uh, significant finding. So, like we said, use padding. So, uh, especially women, they get they get really bad sort of curvature of the spine, and you can't immobilize them. You lay them on their back, and the heat goes up. You know, I mean, you can't you can't immobilize them. And uh, so if you're on their side before, you're on the board trying to protect them, but most of the time you just, like, just anything. And then lastly, I think we have time, this, the cognitively impaired patient, or the special needs patient, okay, it is. Sometimes there's a list here. These are old people, diseases, you know, dementia, <laughs> Alzheimer's, but you get into organic brain syndromes and, and different things and... Uh, they're hard to assess because they're not reliable. They're, they're not a good historian, okay? So they're, it's hard to assess these the patients, okay? Uh, we ran on a, a, I was the second unit in on an NBC, a van, 15 passenger van full, hit the back of a dump truck, and we were the second patient in. And the, the guy on the, uh, the first ambulance there he says, launch every helicopter available and send me as many units as you have. We have 15 patients and they all are critically injured. So we're like, right? We get there, we start packing, and they all seem like they have altered mental status and they all have these, you know, they're exhibiting signs of head injuries and everything. And we're looking at them, we're going, how can they all have sort of the same injury? And we looked around, and it, it was a, a, a special needs bus. They, they all had some sort of special need. And uh, so that altered mentation may have been just their normal mentation. But they were scattered all over the road, so we didn't really know until we found the driver. And we, we started asking the driver about, what about the other guys in the, in the van? Okay. So the... Uh, Anyway, they were all ejected, so they had high mechanisms of injury. Yes. One, one was ejected into the back of the dump truck. Mm. Oh, we were trying to count. We, we found the count. We were going, how many, you know, was in the van? And we talked to the driver. She was, you know, alert and oriented. And, you know, we had a full van. There was 15 of us, and we had 14 patients. And we were trying to find the fifth one. And so my very wisely sort of looked up in the back of the dump truck. They were laying in the back of the dump truck. But uh, anyhow, so you have to rely on the caregiver a lot of times. This may be a big, this will be a big emotional crisis to them, especially trauma. Even feeling bad, even medical is, is somewhat, you know, just having a, a cold or something. Sometimes it's a big emotional thing for them. So you're going to need more time, which you don't have in trauma sometimes, right? But you, you're going to need more time, and uh, they're, they're much harder to do the assessment on. Like I said, the history, they might be confused, upset, un, un, uncooperative. A lot of times they don't want you to mess with them, okay? And this is sort of the same way with this wreck. A lot of them were somewhat combative, you know, and we're trying to figure this out. You know, why, why, are, why are they all similar, right? But anyway, uh, be patient. 
rely on others for the information. It's very, you know, you normally reassess them every five minutes. Uh, reassess them frequently, I mean more than every five minutes. Make sure it's sort of a continuous assessment of their poor historian. Give me a couple minutes, we're almost done. Caregivers for sure, and then when in doubt, treat them for the worst thing available. And that's the same thing that we did on our big wreck, is that once we sort of settled down and figured out they were, they all had sort of the same mentation, uh, we were like, well, maybe this is not such a big thing yet, you know? But uh, we went with the side of caution because they were, most of them were thrown out of the van, so we were like, no, we're gonna take the majority of them to a level one trauma center. And, and that's what we did. So, you know, when, when in doubt, do the most you can, right? Because it, it's, it, it's always better to take two rights and two lefts, right? Yeah. Right. So, size so up the same thing. When we start looking down through this for these uh, special population, any or any trauma patient, good size up. You know, don't don't think this might be the. Don't assume, right? Two years now. It's, trying to teach you don't make assumptions, okay? Don't make assumptions on, on your patients. So, about their existing conditions, especially like on a diabetic patient or uh, altered mental status. Remember, any altered mental status, what do you do? D-stick. Right, doesn't care about their past medical history. If they have an altered mental status, do a D-stick. Takes away that assumption, okay? Same way here. Uh, all, all the time, C-spine, remember, in trauma, jaw thrust to open the airway, that, that's a question that gets a lot. You know, they, they set it up like an oxygen question. You know, you're trying to get the patient, they, they're sort of leading you, misleading you towards oxygen, and all they want you to do is, they're asking you what the question's asking you is how you open the airway. Only two ways we open the airway, right? And the right. So make sure that you understand what they're asking you. Right? And we talked about this already. Bradycardic pediatric patients, really bad. Okay. Oxygenate them, ventilate them uh, quickly. Get, get the heart rate back up. Rapid physical exam on the way to the hospital. Vital signs on the way to the hospital. Everything that's on the way to the hospital. Reassess every five minutes. Get a quick history. Get the information that you need right away. Right? I mean, you'll do your sample and your old PQRSD, but get the information that you need right away. Okay? Uh, very quick history. What happened to you? Were you not, like trauma? You know, my quick history would be, uh, do you remember what happened? Do you remember all your arms and legs? Uh, the, uh-oh, uh hold a moment. Hang on. I'm, I'm buffering. Right. Remember what happened? And move arms and legs. And there it goes. Maybe I'm going to hop on my <laughs> Oh, and did you lose consciousness? Check the ventation. Uh, neuro. And then those are the quick things. Move on. Big things. Lose consciousness. Remember what happened. Then, then you go in to the rest. You hurt anywhere? Right. Those different things. Chief complaint. Very quick history. The sample OPQRST, like we said before, pad the voids, tilt the backboard if needed on on the on the pregnancy patient. P10 elderly pad the voids, okay? Jump thrust. Oxygenate them as needed. Evaluate the need for oxygen. You know what I'm talking about there, right? Are they 94%? Above 94%? Do they present any respiratory, outward respiratory distress or work of breathing? Okay. 
Transport, consider ALS always, especially for multi-system, reassess every five minutes. Okay. So pretty easy, right? I mean, pretty straightforward. Any any questions there? Everybody good?